Well, the, the choice to make models rather than drawings was mine simply because I guess I enjoy doing it. Uh, but I belong to the Woodworkers Guild, and so I have facilities available to, to uh, do this simple modeling, along with some help from local photographers. Um, but the decision to do it was that my experience tells me that explaining something or giving a drawing or a sketch has minimal effect. But when you can show anyone something in the way of a physical model, it has, you immediately get their attention and their response to what you're proposing. And so it's a very, very effective tool and it's a very simple thing to do for anyone in the future who would like to do it. So what we did was, <clears throat> um, this started many, many years ago when the idea had been floated that the city at some point was going to get Main Street back in their control and they were going to do that by having uh, NDOT and the state um, and the Federal Highway people put in a bypass of some sort, whether it would be on the south side of town or the north or whatever. Twenty years ago that wasn't decided. But it was decided that that was going to happen and when that did, Main Street would come back into control of the city. And then we did not need four lanes of car and truck traffic going through the city, the historic district. And it was at that time that, uh, that we then began to think about what we could do. <clears throat> what would be the obvious things that you would do? Well, once you go down to two lanes, that means you have room for angle parking instead of parallel parking. Uh, that increases your parking by a large percentage. Um, you also have uh, available from the sidewalk out uh, 18 feet. You have the ability to put in what we call bump outs. And on those bump outs, you can landscape it so that the city becomes much more park-like and also that area can be used by <clears throat> people walking on the street, local businesses who are in the restaurant business and so on who want to have seating. It, it, those areas give a lot of flexibility to both the customer and the, the uh, property owner as to how they would uh, individually develop those areas. And so what you see here is, uh, is a model that goes from on Main Street from Madison to Pike um, along with uh, the side street <coughs> uh, at the corner of Washington because Washington and Maine are, is the main center of the historic district. And <coughs> I can't remember how many years ago this was, but uh, my son-in-law, Jeremy, Jeremy Stutzman, and I worked together on this model, and the ideas were things that our family hatched. Uh, both Maya and Faye were very involved in, in the idea and the design kind of thing. And so then we went ahead and built this physical model and have had it on display for, in meetings and in store windows and things to try and get <clears throat> the general uh, building owners and business owners to think about it and add their, their ideas to it. <clears throat> and now we've come to a point on June 17th of 2019, finally, where uh, the bypass is in it's working very well. There's very little truck traffic on Main Street. The, the, the car traffic has been cut by a large percentage. And so the historic district has now become a destination for people who, who are coming down here to shop or eat or whatever, and not just going from Fort Wayne to South Bend. 
So that aspect of it has worked very well. Uh, now we're getting down to the details of, of each corner and <clears throat> how we want to design them. Um, one of the problems in doing that is you want to keep it as versatile as possible because businesses move in and out and you can't construct these areas in a very specific way. So uh, we keep that in mind when we're, when we're trying to landscape and or put in seating and all those kinds of things. Um, just this morning, we had a meeting with, with the city engineering group and we're ready now to start <clears throat> another phase. And maybe I should step back first and say that, that when we did this, the implementation of some of this design was pretty well centered around Washington and Main Street. And, and a lot of this we did um, because the city seemed to be all right with it and not restrict us, and as a matter of fact, help us by relocating sewers and doing the, the things that they needed to do. And so we ended up on this corner with an actual model of how it might work and what mistakes we might have made or what we should have done more of and so on. And it's been quite well accepted. And so now that we're ready to expand on this, um, we have some restriction and it's generally around money and funding. Uh, we're not going to do it all at one time. But we are going to, now that we have the Crossroad Center of Washington and Maine established, we're going to move to each end of the historic district and pay attention to the entrance areas. Uh, so that when you enter the historic district, you, you realize you're entering a different place. Um, and so we've made some changes in the number of bump outs and size of them and so on. Uh, we've, one of the things that for me has been important are these arches. Uh, wherever I travel and I see entrance arches to a historic district, it's, it has, a, I, I end up with a real feeling of having entered something different. And so we are going to do our best effort to have an arch on either end of uh, the district. So for now, uh, over the next, the city is going to redo the street surface, uh, and then they're going to restripe uh, the parking and where the bump outs will be, and then we at EID are going to <clears throat> bring as much as we can afford and that the city will allow in the way of, of uh, landscaping and bump out design. And that's sort of where we're at today um, as far as progress. And the hope is that what we do in this sort of interim area, particularly the angle parking, to see that that works and works well as it has in Elkhart. And then in another year or two, I think that we will probably be given the approval to go ahead and sort of do the final phase of, of what we've designed. concept and these ideas established long ago or has everything evolved slowly over 20 years? Well, I think I don't know that others would agree with this, but I think that what we've done is pretty simple. I mean, there's not a lot of variety that you can bring to that and if you look at other towns who have funded these things they do uh, similar things 
And the only uh, difference that I would point out is that in most all the towns that I have observed, it's done more from an engineering standpoint than an artistic standpoint. And that's the difference that our family has tried to bring to this project, is that we're all dedicated to form and color. Um, but the engineering people have to make the sewers work and the lights work and all that, but they're much more structured. And what you'll see is that everything is pretty much the same. If you go to Warsaw, it's all pink petunias. <laughs> Uh, if you go to Elkhart, the same kind of seating, the same kind of everything exists bumped corner to corner. And that's fine, uh, but that's not our approach. You talked about your family, and of course that means you and uh, Faye Peterson and right. Jeremy and Maya Stutzman, right? right? Mm -hmm. okay. And you're saying that this is a more creative and locally determined design than a packaged one or one that is strictly uh, logical from an engineer's point of view. Right. I mean, all towns are struggling with this problem. How do you take your historic district and bring it back to life? And <clears throat> I will say this, as I've said to so many people, what we do here is the easy part. The easy part. Very much so. Buy a building, go back and see what historic details are still alive in it, bring them back, uh, choose paint colors, uh, do the things that have a feeling of turn of the century, if you will, without being very, very particular, because if you're going to do that, you're going to spend a fortune. You can't afford to do that. So you do it in a way where you get the visual effect and the comfort from it, um, but don't become involved in the historic detail to the effect. That's one thing that you can't do, in my opinion. Um, you said it's simple. What the, what the well, alternative, what, demolition and rebuilding? No, the tenants. Pardon me? The tenants. Who comes here day in and day out and runs their business successfully? And that's the key if you want to go right back to the beginning. Know your community. That is absolutely essential. Faye and I have talked about it many times. We would never do this in another town around here. Really? No. For instance, have you ever well, seen Kendallville uh, downtown? Uh, where? Have you seen Kendallville sure. downtown? Sure. Mm -hmm. is, is there any hope for that? For oh, they have some wonderful elements. Yeah. They have some wonderful historic buildings that are still there and alive. Wonderful old post office. That's been, uh, yes. But then we're going to get into... The, um, the uniqueness okay. of why we were able to do this and it has there is a unique nature of our family and our experience and what we were in a position to do but once we did that then it's up to all of these people restaurant owners everybody to, to infill this and spend their life every morning unlocking the door to make it work. We could have done this, and if nobody came, I mean, that's, the, that's my point. So you feel you have good support from oh, absolutely. the downtown community and the larger community. Right, and I blame that a lot on the Mennonite community because they're very community-oriented. Uh, the college, uh, we have elements the size of our community. You can't do this effectively in a small town, and it's much more difficult to do it in something much larger. Goshen is neat size. It has a community that responds to this kind of thing. But make no mistake, Restoring the buildings is the simple part of it. <laughs> You've got to have the community of entrepreneurs to come in and infill it with, with activity that they're not going to run to the mall for. I mean, that's the whole key in this. The malls are what d destroyed us. 
So how do we take back from them what the community will support? And that means there's a lot of people who have to step up and say, I'm willing to put in a pretzel shop and I'll sign a contract for three years with this guy and I'm going to go in every day and make it work and so on. Uh, would you also characterize this community as a, a, a rather educated community uh, or isn't that relevant here? I mean, with well, the college and a lot of people sticking around, uh, especially young people, is that imp uh, how, how important is that? I think it's very important. Um, it's so easy to say that I hear so much, and usually that means three people, <laughs> uh, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. But I do hear a lot about uh, young people who went through the college experience or whatever and couldn't wait to get out of Goshen a few years ago, and now they're coming back. And there's a reason for that. Uh, and one of the top of my list is safety. Goshen, in general, is a very, very safe place to live and bring up your kids and so on. We have a reasonably good school system. Uh, we have elements here, and it's the right size so that a lot of people know each other. And when a lot of people know each other, you eliminate, you, you enhance the safety of a community and the workability of it. And we have a prosperous uh, community of varied uh, industries and business. Is that important? Yes, but the RV industry, as we all know, is cyclical. And uh, we'll have 10 years of wonderful support. And then for a year or two, it goes south. It'll happen again, I'm sure. That doesn't affect so much of what we were doing, I don't think. We're not, just, we're not just enhancing a commercial area. In addition to that, we're trying to make it a place where you and Phyllis will come down and have a cup of coffee and sit and talk to your neighbors. It'll be your backyard. And that's a sort of a, that's something you can't put numbers on. But when people say, I know, I have a lot of friends who say, yeah, I'll meet you downtown. I'll meet you at the brew. It's, it's a sort of a general draw. So there are a lot of elements to it. But for me, the most important one is the, are the people who, the business owners, and how they run their business and, and how interesting it is. Well, the Newell's building is an interesting one, and that's where we are today on the second floor. Uh, it was established, I believe, originally they were across corner, 1880s, and then the brothers decided to come over here, and they ended up with both of these stores were the Newell's Brothers store. And it was a, uh, basically a clothing store, but they did furniture and a lot of other things, sort of a general store. When, when I came here, it was being run by uh, Jay Rounds and his wife, and she was a Newell descendant. She was part of the family. So it had been in the family ownership and activity until, mm, I, I, the, the dates will get away from me, but we, we did this one in 2003 or four, something like that, when we bought this. And this was, this was a, a kind of a typical restoration. Um, over the years, it had uh, reduced in size where they were just using the first floor of the corner building. And it was a woman's clothing store, nothing much else. And so when we went in, there was purple carpet on the floor, there was quarter-inch um, paneling on the walls. The ceiling had been dropped down with fluorescent lighting, and, um, and we came in here and stripped it, and it was all there. The round windows were open. 
the Newell sign, they had a huge wooden awning that, that went all around this corner of the building, and underneath it was the um, stained glass Newell sign. The one on the front had been destroyed, but the side was there. And so, and we repainted the color on the outside, uh, and then refinished the floor, uh, took the ceiling out back to the original tin ceilings, uh, put in different lighting. Uh, and now you have, when you walk into that building, if, you're, if you really know, <laughs> as Irvin does, it's not a perfect restoration, but it's 90%. And for the average person, it takes you right back in history. This is how it used to be. And it's very desirable to most people. Um, and that is the pattern that we use building after building. Looking at them, deciding to what extent we needed to restore it to his, its original condition without being fussy to every possible detail. And one of the things that we did and still do is we remove a plaster wall surface to expose the old brick. Now that was not original. They were originally plastered, but the brick surface on the inside, at least on one side of, of each valley, really gives you a feeling of a more natural environment. Okay, this is the upstairs of the main building. Um, the floors, did you strip? Stripped them back. Floors? Yep. Stripped them and back. you sanded these? Yep. Lightly. <laughs> okay. Sort of a fancy design, right? Yeah. It's a Chevron design, which I haven't seen anywhere. And, and beautiful, beautiful big windows. Right. Uh, not original. Not original. No. They've been replaced. I have all the old ones over in storage. Okay. okay but the shape. Yeah, the size is exactly the same. What about the globe hanging lamps? Were those uh, here? Or? Those were not, but I'm sure something like them were. Those are school globes, which we use a lot in our building. This is unique. I've never seen, I don't know that downtown has a tin ceiling on the second floor. Oh, I see. Okay, I was going to ask about the yeah. tin ceiling. So yeah. this is a new tin ceiling? No, it's old. Okay, did you have to restore it? Some. Some. Okay. Uh, that's characteristic of many of the stores you've restored. Yeah. Most of the first floors have tin ceilings. Yeah. Rarely. I don't think this, I've ever seen it on the second floor. Uh -huh. So but, why did you do this? I mean, it's not being used, and the use of it is sort of problematic. So I'm asking sort of a personal question. What motivates you to, uh, to restore something like this? Well, there were two possibilities. Um, as you know, kitty corner across the Washington Street here, we did the second floor into what we call the flop house, which are artist studios. And we thought we might do that here, separate this into studio spaces. Um, there hasn't been enough call for that yet. And in the meantime, I've made a model of a residential, two residential units up here. Uh, and I think that that's probably, I don't know that I will do them, but I think that's what will probably happen. And if you want to just step back and take a look at that, I'll show you. I'll have uh, second floor residential areas uh, been received in the ocean. Um, very well. If you have one, you can rent it. There's no problem with getting. But what you, what someone like myself has to decide is, do you want to be involved in residential or commercial? And we've made the decision that, that residential is not as interesting to us. However... What about selling units on the second floor? Do they sell? Selling what? Do do residential units on the second floor of these buildings. Can you sell them? 
You can. And next, is there a market for them? Right. right across the street, they condominiumized that building. And there are three people with apartments up there that they own. I own the first floor. So we have a condominium arrangement. But you talk about rent, renting these. Do you prefer that? or do you? I do because you keep control of it. Uh, if you, and we have that across. If you have residential over commercial and you happen to have a bar on the first floor that's open till two in the morning, the guys upstairs are in trouble. So uh, having control of, of these things is important. But this is what, um, This is what I think will happen up here. I haven't detailed the second part, but you come up the entrance here and we have a full apartment. Um, and this is another concept of mine that I think is worthwhile, and that is this unit right here. One of the problems of, of developing second floors is water in and water out. And so we have designed this so that the kitchen, the bathroom, laundry room, everything is a unit that you can build and you can put it wherever, wherever you want it. And then the rest is open space. Um, and that sort of uh, general living space is, is what most of the young people like. They like the openness and so on. So I think that probably this will end up being two residential units that we will own and rent. Here we go back to the young people. Uh, this is really appealing to young people, isn't it? Very. The downtown. Oh, yeah. I get asked all the time, do I have anything downtown to rent to live in? Yeah. See, right now, we have this little planter and we have this. That's, that's, and we have outside seating. And then this is the second step, where you bump out into Main Street the way we have into Washington. So that's the way most of the corners will look. You no, um, uh, not that would be. I understand why you say that, but um, here, this is again knowing your community, okay? And if you've ever been down here on First Fridays, you get a half a block either way from this corner, and it diminishes quickly. And it's one of the problems that some of our really good retailers like the Olympia, they're two blocks away. They have their own clientele, but they don't get the street traffic. And this is, a, this, we've, we've succumbed to the fact that this is the center of our center. And so we're going to try and make this much more park-like. Now, when you get to the other corners, um, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to have this kind of, of so park. Will the this will be the, it will. Right. And in time, maybe, but for now, if we did this at every corner, it would be wasted. We know that. Well, David, uh, tell us the interesting story of how you generated this model that we've been looking at. Well, I have a funny story to tell, and I don't think Henry will, will object to it. Uh, I have a friend, uh, Hank Weaver, uh, who's, Hank is now in his 90s, um, nicest man you'll ever meet. Uh, and I went to him one day and I said, I want to photograph the fronts, the facades of the buildings downtown so that I can get them printed out and use them as a, as a, as a model I want to build. And he said, fine, wonderful. I said, I have an old bucket truck that I use. How about if you get in the bucket truck on a Sunday when there's not much parking, and I'll just drive down and you tell me when to stop and when to start, and we'll go right down the center of the street. Fine. So we did that. Um, and a day later, Henry called me and said, uh, Dave, I didn't have any film in my camera. <laughs> He was so embarrassed. So that was how we started. And uh, so you did it he put again. film in the camera, and we did it two or three different times. And that's part of the process. And why it's so easy. 
you get that, he printed it out in three foot lengths, you paste it on the OSB board and you cut them out and you put them there and you've got a city. Mm -hmm. Okay, well let's go way back to the beginning, Dave. Um, if you think about your life, well, about your residence in Goshen, where did this all start? When did you do the first uh, renovation or preservation around here? Well, let me step back further than that, maybe, because it may be interesting. Um, when I was a 10th grader in high school, I lived out in the country and I had a lot of neighbors who needed septic tanks dug up and fences made and so on. And so I started a little company with my friends. Mm. And I hired half a dozen of them and bought an old Model A Ford, cut the top out as a pickup and spent two summers doing that. So. Um, I had a father who had had a very severe heart attack, and so I was the youngest of three, and my brother and sister were gone in their lives, and so I was, right from the beginning, I had to work. I knew that, and so that, why that sort of appealed to me. Um, and you were a teenager, and you had this I was company. in 10th grade. Wow. And then uh, my folks built a very small, modest home, and my dad said to the contractor, will you allow Dave to work with you? That was the next year, and so that was my first project. And, um, and then I got drafted in the Army and sent to Korea. And this is, I think, is an interesting little piece of it. Um, we were, I was in the artillery, and we were brought off the boat and put in our area. And it turned out we were in an area called Smoke Valley, <laughs> and what it was, was a three or four mile di diameter valley that the, that the enemy could look right into. The mountains were high and they could look right in. So it was very dangerous. And what they had done is they placed 55 gallon drums of crude oil all around the valley. And depending on the wind, they would burn them. So we lived in oil smoke. <laughs> Hard to believe, but that was it. So they couldn't be seen. So the old colonel decides we're not going to do this. He calls a meeting of people, of a bunch of us, and he says, does anybody here have construction uh, experience? <laughs> right? Little Davy puts his hand up. He said, here's what I want to do. I want to go up in the mountain right here, and I want to build our battalion headquarters up there. And we'll go back offline, and we'll log, and we'll bring that equipment up, and we'll build. Can you do that? No problem. How old were you? 21. Okay. Um, so I spent the night wide awake making drawings, which I had done draftsman a few years before. And so the next morning I presented him with drawings of it, and the job was mine. I was a corporal, drafted. I was given 180 Korean servicemen and anybody in the battalion, including a couple of lieutenants, were under my command. And I was given two bulldozers and all the dynamite I wanted. And we carved out a big niche in the side of the mountain. We went back and logged, and we built the village. <laughs> and I was discharged with a bronze star for Martyr. What's the word? <laughs> Martyr. So Goshen is simple compared uh, yeah. to. So, you know, when you start with that kind of experience and then you start a real life of, of, of getting married and having a home, I've never lived in a new home. Every home was the restoration. And so when I came to this, this is pretty simple. Mm -hmm. But I also have a family who's very artistic. That's very important mm -hmm. because It's not difficult to, to do the kind of things that most towns do. I don't want to diminish it. It's important. But it's very engineering oriented. But if you're going to try and do something different and get a better effect, then you've got to have some different experience. And I just happen to have had that through my life. Uh, historically, do you want to say anything about the Honeyville store or the Southside Soda Shop? 
Well, um, I was in the plastic business for 25 years in Detroit. And that again was a very creative industry because I was in it very early. It was a thermoforming, which meant you could build molds in two hours. You could, you could develop all kinds of product uh, and ideas very quickly. And so it was very creative side of the plastic business. Decided to get out of it. Um, I had made connection with the Amish because I was down here selling mobile home trailer parts. Uh, they came to me and said, the Honeyville store has been closed for 15 years. Would you be interested? What? I talked to my 16-year-old daughter and said, what do you want to do? She said, let's go. So we bought the store, restored it, opened it back up to the community. It was a, it was a remarkable opportunity. Um, and then one day, uh, my friends Don Walters and his wife Faye called me and said, the old soda shop is going to be for sale. You want to restore it? Sure. So I joined hands with them. And uh, to my great surprise, once we got it restored to the place we wanted it, we had to run it. <laughs> and nobody wanted to do that. So we turned it over to my daughter and her husband, who after 31 years are still there and, and have a very good business. You, you use the term restored. Um, Dave, it doesn't look anything today like it did originally. No. You, had, you, you turned it into a uh, diner, traditional We diner. built the diner on, yeah. right, and that was a lot. Faye and I collaborated to design that space. So, so your work in, in uh, transforming buildings ranges from sort of creating a new structure like uh, Southside Slope Shop right. and uncovering the historical nature of a lot of these buildings now. Exactly. Okay, good. Uh -huh. So, how many buildings do you own in Goshen? Do you know? Well, because you asked the question, I have an answer to that. Uh, we own, I think, 14 buildings plus the mill race. Plus, what do you mean, plus the mill race? The, oh, the, uh, the, uh, and, the, and the um, brick building at the... The mill race, the market, the guilds, oh, all of okay. that. Oh, okay, all right, on yes, on the, all right, the mill race. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, the former lumber company. Right. And how many additional buildings have you worked on for other people? Do you have any idea? Mm -hmm. I mean, you just finished the Art Deco restoration of the um, grocery store. And mm -hmm. You've done work for other people in improving their building? Well, yeah, I get involved in two ways. I've been on the facade committee for years, and uh, so people who want to do something uh, come and say, what can we do? Uh, two things, what would be appropriate and what will the facade group support? And so I was at that and I'd go down, we'd look and talk and so on, and then they'd make a, a proposal to facade and, and if it was accepted then I would kind of oversee the project, getting you know, someone to do the work and so on. Um, generally that was how most of the non-owned real estate was handled. I mean, a lot of people come and say, what should I do, Dave? But uh, get to getting involved to that extent. So your influence has been a lot more than just the buildings you have bought and fixed up. Oh, for yeah. Yourself. Oh, yeah. Uh, informal and actual work I on the buildings. Number, but some reason I can't find it. Well, that's OK. okay. I'm sure it's an intangible number anyway. Uh, do you have any? buildings that you're really pleased about. Oh, here we go. Um, 20 singles and five doubles, plus the mill race. What does that mean, singles uh, and doubles? We own the bookstore and then next door, which are double wides buildings. I see. I see uh, what you mean. So we had five double wides and 20 single buildings. Mm -hmm. 
uh, plus the Milroy's that we've worked on over the years. Okay. Is there any special achievement that you can point to here? Which, which pleased you the most, the way it turned out? It's a no-brainer. Okay. The all, five guilds. All your children are favorites, right? No. The, 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 oh, the, oh, the guild. The, oh, okay, the guild at yeah. the lumber company. Yeah. That pleases you the most. Absolutely. Tell us why. Because the number of people that are involved, and I can't tell you how many people who are members of one of those five guilds have come to me and say, Dave, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have this place to come to. Uh, and I personally don't know why that, if, if nothing else happened, why towns don't do that. It's easy by comparison. Mm -hmm. The restoration of the facility is one thing, but uh, um, getting to understand your community and what they are interested in and are there key people, that was always the issue. If we wanted to start the Clay Guild, we had to go, well, first of all, we knew that uh, the college had a strong clay program and that there were a lot of people who continued that process either commercially or for fun. And so we had to find one or two people who had been through that system who were still very involved and would be willing to help organize the guild and to some extent manage it. And one after another we found it, you know. Fred Driver and Clay, Ken Meyer and the Woodworkers Guild, uh, Bob Morris and Photography. Uh, um, Judy Winnie for jewelry. Uh, we went to, uh, um, I'm sorry, the name's forget, the lady who ran the jewelry department at the college and had retired, Judy Wars. Judy, Judy Wars Winnie, of course. Right. right. Yeah. Came to her and said, would you be interested in running a guild? And she said, well, I've just retired, but maybe in a year or two. So we waited. And then she came back and said, sure. Uh, Danny. The lumber company was certainly a prime candidate for demolition, oh, right? Absolutely. Yeah. There are three facilities that, that we have restored that were in that category. The mill race, number one. Uh, number two was uh, what used to be E.B. Ford and then Sigmund Printing and so on on the uh, corner. The gas station. The gas station. Now the bubble. Right. Um, and the third one, <laughs> I'll remember. Oh, that's terrible. That's OK. That's yeah. all right. Yeah. Um, is there a one project that really uh, bombed or you're really um, disappointed with or no worst Not case? Yet. No worst case. Not yet. Oh, the third one was the half block. Okay. The city was the city owned it, and we're going to tear it down. The electric, uh, yeah, electric brew, the water department, the ignition unit, <clears throat> uh, and that that is key. Uh, I remember going to a symposium at Notre Dame early on, and some fellow from Baltimore, Maryland, or something, who was a very experienced in this pro the kind of thing. He said, when he opened his talk, he said, I want to tell you one thing. Do not tear down one brick of your historic district. And then for two hours, he went through the whole thing. And when it was through, he said, I want you to remember, do not tear down one brick. <laughs> so that had an impact because when we entered this process of buying buildings and so on, there was a lot of support for tearing buildings down. City had already gone out for bids on the half block, okay? Uh, the building across the street, which was uh, not the Eagles or one of those organizations that... Oh, that um, wonderful... Italian name yes. been re yeah, re Wanted to get that down. Mm -hmm. um, certainly the mill race, get the bulldozer. Sigmund printing, all for parking. Mm -hmm. That was the focus. And that is the big mistake that a lot of towns have made and will continue to make. Mm -hmm. Don't tear down one brick. Mm -hmm. Restore it, and there are other ways to get parking. Let's talk about business. Do you have a business? Are you licensed as a corporation or, or what? Or is this just individual enterprise yeah. buying and fixing? Yeah. Okay, that's interesting because 
of all the properties you own and work mm -hmm. with. Um, how did you do this work? I know you did an awful lot of the work by yourself, mm -hmm. but you had other employees. Uh -huh. They were contract employees, or how did you, how, how did they relate to you as, as workers? Well, most of them were people who were individual contractors, construction guys. Okay. And they are an absolute element to this process because um, you couldn't go to a, an established construction company. It's not their interest. They're not interested in restoration. Mm -hmm. And so you have to find people who have been hammering and nailing all their life and will take instruction <clears throat> and uh, work with them, be there. And it was a combination of some experienced people and other people like Jeremy. He was in college. Mm -hmm. And in summers he wanted a job and so this was an obvious thing. And then when he got out of college, this is what he wanted to do. So there were a number of different people who joined this changing group, but all had experience to bring to it. Mm -hmm. And then with the guidance that Faye and I would give as to what we wanted done, mm -hmm. that's how you proceed. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't a typical business model. No. You hired people who were available and, right. like I said, con in effect, contract employees. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and Jeremy, now our mayor, uh, started working with you as soon as he He was in college. Maya and, no, he was in college. Okay, and, um, and he continued until he became mayor? Each there. summer he worked, and then when he got out, he worked pretty much full time. We worked together, mm -hmm. okay. and then he decided to run for mayor. So it's good we have a mayor who shares your vision. Well, it's very important because he has, <clears throat> yes, he has that experience and unlike I would say a lot of people in that position, he has a broader view of what should and shouldn't be done. So yes, there's support and he, he uh, brings that to the city council and to the redevelopment and people like that. I've been overhearing you for many years, as you know, uh, and I remember one time when you said that the uh, city of Dunkirk in Indiana had approached you to help them with their downtown. Am I mistaken? Or yes, I don't know what Dunkirk is. Um, you, you, you weren't? I think it's in you Germany. You didn't go to, <laughs> uh, no, that's in France. <laughs> okay. But Dunkirk yeah, right. is this little town uh, which was once very prosperous in the glass industry. And it oh. has a wonderful glass museum with nothing labeled, you know. Um, and, and at that point, as I recall, you thought of going into a kind of consultancy. Yeah. Hiring yourself out as a consultant right. to towns like that. Yeah. What became of that? Well, you're absolutely right. I'd forgotten that one. Um, um, yes, after we had done the things we'd done here and, and had a record, um, we decided to form a company called City Elements. City Elements. And it was my and Jeremy and Faye and I, four of us. And we all agreed that we'd take on certain responsibilities in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you're right. One of the first things is we got a call from a lady who, I can't remember, maybe Ben Dunker. Uh, and I, I honestly can't remember what came of it. Nothing, but I don't know why and what we did. But then after that, we got a call from the city of Elkhart. <clears throat> and they said, would you come up? We have our old train station that we want to know what to do with. And uh, so we went up, had a meeting with, I think it was the city council. And strangely enough, Mark Brinson, who now runs our redevelopment group, was on that group. That's the first I met Mark. And we made a proposal to them as to one of the ways that we thought they could redevelop that area and how it could be used. And uh, I think they decided they knew better. Yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. They were ready to demolish it. They were, but then they decided to keep it, and I don't know what they did with it. But after that experience, I think we all went home and looked at each other and said, <laughs> is this really what we want to do? Uh -huh. 
<laughs> or do we just want to do what we do in, Bo in Goshen and let it go with that? And that's yeah. what happened. Okay. So we disbanded. Um, <clears throat> you want to say some more about uh, phase participation in all of this? What, what, uh, what does the city owe to your wife, Faye Peterson? Well, Faye, um, in her first marriage, <clears throat> when I first got to know them, um, they were in college at the University of Michigan. Uh, after that, or during the summers, Don took a job at the Ford Museum uh, in the folk art area with Bob Bishop. And then, because of that, um, they were solicited by Colonial Williamsburg, and Don went down there and was assistant curator of the Abbey Rockefeller collection, folk art, and Faye uh, was in the reproduction program where uh, she would look at <coughs> things in the collection and decide what things might be saleable as reproductions and then go out and establish sources. And so, so that was, and at the same time, they were serious collectors with no money. But they, they used that to build, start build their own collection, but they also used that experience in their eye and their understanding to help build the Rockefeller collection. And so at one point I said to them, I know you guys are sick and tired of doing this for Abby Rockefeller, why don't you do it for yourself? Come to Goshen, we'll get in the antique business together, and go, because I'd been in the business for a long time and was doing the major shows around the country. So that's what they did. And um, as part of that, they divorced, and years later, Faye and I uh, were married. But it was their experience and mine that really did mesh, and we had a, a real consistent interest in the kind of material that we became experienced in. And so when it came time to do this, Faye said, Dave, a building is just a big antique. This is not a problem. We, this is something we can do easily. So she, Faye never got involved in the physical doing of things, but it was an absolute partnership in first of all investment. Are we gonna, because we did this all on our own, are we gonna be willing to put that money forward and am I willing to take the time and join our experience and make decisions. So that was her part of that, which was serious and still is. It seems I've heard you or somebody say that she's um, especially involved in colors, choice of colors. In design in general. Design in general, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Now, how about you and uh, government? Um, you talked about the EID, the Economic Improvement, Improvement District. District. Is that a government project or is that a merchant's project, Chamber of Commerce? No, it was the government, the, it's, it was formed by the city council, I don't remember the year, but a number of years ago, and is still approved by the city council, the budget and so on, but they're not at all active in detail. Okay, are, are these the people who we spoke to last week about the uh, house on 3rd Street, or is that a separate? Um, are they the people who sponsored the clearance of those factories? And no, <laughs> well, EID is limited to Madison to Pike, alley oh, to alley. I see. We don't go to 3rd Street or 5th Street. So okay. it's just the historic the old oh, historic, historic district, district, right. Okay, all right. And the money comes from where? The money comes from taxing the building of, owners. Of, of the buildings and within that district. the city makes a, an annual contribution too. Mm -hmm. And that has, you felt comfortable working within that uh, organization? Um, yes, in general I do. Um, um, Uh, this needs to be said. Um, I don't care what group you look at, whether it's the mayor's office, city council, the water department, any of the city functions. 
what we do is a stranger to almost everybody in those departments. They do what they do well, but to design this kind of thing, no way. They're, but it doesn't mean they don't have <laughs> opinions. <laughs> and if there's ever a rub, that's where, where I get, I mean, 90% of it is fine, but the 10% where somebody on one of those committees makes a decision that their experience says that you can't do this, when it's obvious that it's, <laughs> it's not right, then you have, to, you have to work through that. But it, that's what it is. And but in general, very good. Does the facade grant come from that organization and the program? The facade money comes from I know I should know and I'm not sure, but it comes from I think the city council and Okay, I'm not sure. Can figure that yeah, out. I'm not sure. But it looks as though the facade program has been a really major influence on the physical appearance of downtown Goshen. Is that true? Um, I would say the facade committee. <clears throat> the most important thing they've done is they've eliminated mistakes. Eliminated mistakes. What do you mean? People making a decision they're going to paint their building purple. And the facade committee finds out about it and runs to them and says, wait a minute, that's not acceptable. But we will give you up to $4,000 if you'll paint it red. <laughs> okay. um, my, act, my activity on the facade committee was more proactive. Um, I would, first of all, with Henry Weaver, I photographed the whole town and I made a... a a photographic record of all of the downtown buildings in the facade area. And we use that to look at. But I take that and I make priority by the year and say, well, here are six of the worst problems. Let's go to them and say, we can help you. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yes, but we need to have an input on what you're going to do. And almost without exception, they're very uh, appreciative and get involved. Uh, there are a few people who know the system as always and they know how to get a facade grant every time they want to do something. But for the most part, uh, uh, it's been most, I think, most productive by taking a proactive stance and getting the worst handled and, and they've done a good job of that. The facade program has also sponsored awnings, right? Downtown, yes. which is a major uh, it is in making it a comfortable, uh, attractive place to be. Yeah, if you'll notice, my buildings don't have many on it. Is that right? Well, uh, I think you can overdo it. And if you look at the early pictures uh -huh. of the downtown, they all have these huge awnings that come uh -huh. down. I mean, it looks like a tent city. And, and they also cover the upper uh, windows yep, in many often. cases. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it interrupts the uh, architecture. Yeah. So I've, I'm all for some awnings, uh, but not everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think it would be fair to say that early on, <clears throat> you and the city government, maybe the mayor, didn't get along so well. But now you do. Do you want to <laughs> comment on that? or? Sure. Just comment on what, on what happened and how that happened. <laughs> um, Alan Kaufman was the mayor when we started this, and um, I got along very well and still do with him. And Alan will, I think, say this. Uh, this goes back to my saying that uh, there isn't a lot of experience in this kind of thing. And Alan was the first to admit that he had no idea what to do. And so uh, in his area of responsibility, he pretty much gave me free reign. I would go and say, you know, this is one, blah, blah. And he'd say, sounds good to me. Um, and uh, I don't know if he made this 
announcement to his department heads, but I could call the street department, the water department, and boy, they would come right now and do what we needed done. So there was a, a real sense of cooperation. Now, get it in the council's hands and ask for some financial support and so on. Now you begin to get the personal uh, opinions. And, and then, of course, when Jeremy followed Alan, we've talked about that, he had much more experience in what the overall plan was. And my, my experience with the city has been very positive. Uh, well, you're, you're ignoring the uh, controversy over the widening of Madison Street. Oh, sure. When uh, it was approved by the city government and pushed by the city government and yep. opposed by the Old Town Neighborhood Association yep. and you, I think. Yep. Uh, oh, so you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, this, this goes to the heart of, of, of city restoration. Um, you have to look beyond. You can't do it. You, you, you can do it in stages, but you can't make decisions this way because when you get down here, you realize you really screwed up. Mm -hmm. And that was my... I was always... Um, asking for a bypass. And I didn't know if that was going to be County Road 40 area so that all the RV guys never got here. And then I think it was under Bob McCoy, they decided, or maybe Mary, that the north sector would work. And I was very, I didn't think that was very good, but I will have to admit that it has worked well. We do not have the truck traffic and the pedestrian traffic downtown. But the problem was the state highway department, sure. which wouldn't consider that overpass. Yeah. And they wanted to send all the traffic across the railroad and yeah. into four-lane yeah. roads. Well, and what you have to ask yourself is what's finally happened. Why couldn't it have happened 15 years ago? Right. And that was my argument. Don't, don't make a boulevard the four-lane highway out of 3rd Street because in a few years the Mill Race area is going to be very much a part of the historic district mm -hmm. and it has to be walkable. Mm -hmm. And so don't divide it. Get yourself on board for this bypass. Put your attention there. Mm -hmm. That was my argument. But that, what the bypass was, we were told, was impossible at that point. But it wasn't. By the state. Yeah. Well, state changed its mind or found the well, money. Well, that's right. That's so, right. don't do Third Street and keep after the bypass. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a place where some grassroots opposition made a difference, I think. In yeah, they got the some sort of a long injunction on certain things, and yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, tell us about the uh, pavilion that you have hmm. been very much um, in favor of. Is that turning out the way you hoped it would? I think so. Um, I don't know how long it's been, 20 years maybe. Uh, Vic Coop, a friend of mine from the Woodworkers Guild uh, who was a Canadian and a hockey player, mm -hmm. said, we need a hockey rink. <laughs> really? We talked about it and I said, okay, we can do that. And so I took that on and for the last 18, 20 years, whatever it is, I've built at least three different models, um, have solicited everyone I know and at one point about four years or five years ago, the Schrock, I met with the Schrock family and they agreed that was the legacy project they wanted for Harold. Mm -hmm. And so we were off and running. <clears throat> and after about six months, they decided to go against it. And at that point, after all these years, I began to be worn out about it. But it was continued by a number of people. Um, Jeremy has certainly been in favor of it and has been <coughs> an important part of it. And it is now to the point where they contracted with an architectural firm in Indianapolis. They have 
architectural drawings of what they want to do. They've raised two-thirds of the money. I think by next year they will have raised enough funds to maybe break ground. And I think it's, it will, if properly run, again, uh, and it's going to be run by the Parks Department, not by uh, individuals, um, I think it will be a real asset for this general historic area. The Community Foundation has given some money to it. Have. Mm -hmm. have you also, are you also one of the donors for the? Not yet. Not yet. Time. Time. I've given 20 years. That's okay. worth something. And will your uh, concept, your drawings and designs influence what they're doing in Indianapolis? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, what are you going to do about that? Yes, but what are you going to do about that? Nothing. Nothing. No. No. So who in Goshen then is carrying the ball on that? Uh, well, I would say the mayor's office. Uh -huh. I think Jeremy is the one who's kept it alive. He's made all the contacts for financial support. Mm -hmm. He's got the council on board, I think, pretty much. And yeah. Okay. Now these are some questions that sort of are out of place, and maybe David can put them in the right place. Um, has it been profitable for you to do this work, buy buildings and fix them up and rent them? Uh, are you making any money, or is this all charity, or nonprofit, or public service, or? The only charity I have is my daughter who runs the solution. <laughs> no, it's a profitable venture. Okay. Um, but for reasons. Um, number one, we have um, a community of entrepreneurs who have made the decision, the hard decision of this overall thing, to set up their restaurant and stick in there and work hard and pay their rent. Pay the rent. Yeah. And uh, we have had a very, very substantial group of local people, some who were not in business at the time and starting something new and others who had moved from somewhere else. Uh, and so we've had almost no vacancy. Um, we have been in a position, and this is part of, if you want to call it charity, we have had, uh, numerous times have had to subsidize things in either rent reductions or leasehold improvements that would normally be done by the tenant we would do and things like that. But there was enough volume where you weren't dependent on one or two, and that was, that's key. In, in doing your financial calculations, uh, have you counted your own hours that you have no. devoted to these buildings? <laughs> if you had been paid, you know, oh. $30 an hour. Uh, I'll take 10. 10, okay. All right. No. Okay. Uh, it's not, if you want to compare it to having a job, no. It's not financially. So every city who's going to do redevelopment needs somebody like you. Well, we can get to that if you want. Uh, I have a formula that uh, I'd be glad to share for, because as I told you at the beginning of this, um, more important than just m my history and so on, for me, it's now looking back after all these years and saying to the world, here's how we did it. Here's 80% of what you have to follow. Here are the mistakes we made. Uh, it's possible. You can do this. Mm -hmm. But here are the elements that you have to have in place. So that's another thing. And is this, this formula what we're doing now, what you're talking about Part now, or have you written you it out? Or no, no, just... So we've got your philosophy in, in this interview well, pretty much? Well, to some extent. I'm, I'm willing to get to that if okay. you guys have the time. I have another question first. Mm -hmm. Have you been the manager of these rentals, or do you have a, a business manager or something? You collect the rent. I collect the rent. I deal with all the broken that, toilets that, and the leaky easy. roofs. That's not easy. It isn't. It's, uh, yeah. It doesn't interrupt my golf game, but it's... <laughs> you play golf? I didn't know. No. <laughs> Here's a question you might not want to answer. Um, I'm sure you've planned your the disposition of your estate, 
when you and I pass on. Uh, what's going to happen to these buildings? Well, first of all, I'm not going to die. That, I that, see. That we're okay. start with you got that <laughs> recorded? Um, no, that's a, a real concern for both Faye and I. Uh, and uh, we, ha we discuss it with the family. We have a will. Uh, we have made distributions to those that we think are interested uh, and not want to burden them, you know. Um, so it's a, a combination of, and it's a moving target all the time as we get older uh, or things happen in our life with ourselves or the kids. Um, we move closer and closer to probably being open to selling buildings to people who are tenants now. Um, we don't need to know, own all of these forever. And um, so I think we've taken care of that. And it's, as I say, it's a moving target, so. Okay. Um, so should I ask that question? Sure. Okay. Uh, you won some awards. I know you won a, a, a national award, I think, didn't you, for your work? Yeah, I uh, think one of the what, early. I'm what sorry. was that? Yeah. Well, one of the early ones was the Historical Society gave Faye and I mm -hmm. an award for our work, um, and then um, next I think came uh, the Indiana Association of Cities and Towns in 2014. They, uh, at, at Allen's, uh, I think uh, suggestion, they gave an award to. Maya, Jeremy, and Faye and I, as a group, went down to India and got that. And then uh, following that, the La Casa, um, there's a Dorothy Richardson Award that's given annually, and there are seven districts in the country, and we're in the Midwest, and La Casa recommended us and told us, don't worry, you're not going to get it, but we, we need to recommend. Sure enough, <laughs> off to Washington we went and got that award. And it was really nice because the other six people uh, were really interesting, down-to-earth people who were doing things like, like community you. gardens. Like and, you. Uh, yeah, it, was, it really melt, made me feel personally. Uh, very proud to be a part of that group. They weren't professionals no, and no, engineers no, and so on. No, okay. these were, yeah, <laughs> it was wonderful. Well, uh, how about summing up? Um, what advice do you have for people who live here and the politicians and other leaders uh, regarding further development of Goshen? I mean, we've seen your plans for uh, what's going to happen next in terms of uh, the change in the downtown uh, mm -hmm. streets. Mm -hmm. Other ideas or directions or advice that you might have? Well, <clears throat> when I look back at our 25 or 30 years of this, um, I think that um, it would have been wise of us, and certainly would of others, to um, get more information on your community. For me, the key to this whole process is knowing your community. I mean, we can all do different things, but if it's not supported, you're dead. So you've got to get into this sort of area where you're talking to people, what if we did this, what would your part be, and so on. And that's city government, it's the mayor, it's individual entrepreneurs, it's people who are maybe in another town who have expressed an interest in getting to your town. And if you can, if you can make a substantial summary of that interest, that's the place you need to start. You don't need to start by painting your building blue instead of red. Um, and once you, once you have that information and can share that with these other entities, like city government, which is certainly very important, and get their support, 
and tell them what that support is going to entail, you're going to have to change your sewers. You're going to have to change your lighting. You're going to have to close the street. These are things that a sort of a general plan that you and the city are going to have to think about and tell us if you feel that it's a good idea and get on board. And once you get this kind of general plan, this model is not exactly what's going to happen. A plan doesn't, isn't exact. It's a general outline that you can then tweak as you go along with experience. But you need that to start with. We didn't have that. We walked into this absolutely blind. Mm -hmm. We walked into it on the basis that the, that the town was going dark, like a lot of them were. A lot of the retailers were very marginal not only in what they were offering, but that they weren't doing good business in themselves and weren't going to last. We didn't survey any of that. We just decided that we were going to mm -hmm. take the part of restoration of physical buildings and then hope that that would attract. And it did. But it did because of Goshen. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> so, for you, David, that was intuitive or experiential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas city planners, professional city planners, you know, have to come up with a rational dot them and cross plan. the T's. You bet. So is that what you're calling for? Or? I'm calling for a combination, because I'll get to the second part. <clears throat> um, so if you have, if you've, somebody has to do that. Somebody has to call for a, an overall plan. Well, who would that be? It could be, it could be anybody. I didn't own a building. I didn't own a, I didn't sit on a committee. I didn't do anything. I was just a guy who decided, hey, this would be fun, right? Um, so that has to somehow get organized to some extent. But when you do that, then, then you've got to move to the different players that are going to have to be on board if it's going to work and work well. And the city is the starting point for that. But then you have to have some individual components that just happen to be in my, myself, <laughs> I don't want to say that. I had the experience of construction. I have experience in the antique world, not just of, of tables and chairs, but buildings, color and form. Uh, Good taste. Well, that comes out of the experience. Yeah, Faye and I argue about taste all the time, but uh, yes. Uh, and then you have to have the finances. I mean, I mean, everybody points to that first. You know, who's gonna buy it? Who's gonna pay for it? So all of those elements happened to fall with Faye and I. We had enough resources to do this incrementally. We made a decision we'd like to do it. And instead of going for the overall plan and so on, we just decided to do it by example. And that also works, but it's a lot more risky because you're gonna run into problems on the way that you could have solved to begin with. So my advice to the city planners uh, is if you're fortunate enough to have somebody like Faye and I, which is very rare, and I realize that, then you're going to have to go and find one or two or three people or foundations, a combination, who say, you know, this is a $10 million project that we're looking at here. Are you interested? If you are, give us a number. Three million? Good, we got you. So you've got the financial side, which is often a stumbling block. You've got that covered. Now you've got the city on board. You've got a general plan. And now you can start going to the community uh, in, in a number of ways and get their feedback, which I will say 90% of it is useless. It's opinion, 
It's not based on experience. It's not based on much of anything, but well, I hate angle parking. <laughs> Why? I don't know. I just hate it. My grandma doesn't like to back up. <laughs> um, so it's not rocket science, but it takes a combination of experience and effort that's rare. Restoration of small towns is not something that everybody does. And often those that do it, do it careful, carelessly, or they do it with, with individual interest. And that doesn't work. It has to be something that you either do and show them that it can be done, and then you get them on board, or you get the plan and know that this is how we were able to do it. So that's my general, um, and I'd be glad to talk to anybody in the world about it. <laughs> and I'm sure it has turned out different or better than you ever imagined. Maybe, maybe not, but. I don't think we ever imagined. I, see. I think we just were doing it piecemeal. Okay. And, and we're very fortunate that this community liked it, got behind it, and are doing a lot. Could, could I add a question? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Just like community development or, or what you've been doing or what's been happening to the downtown over the 20 years, like how would you define that? Or, or maybe even like more basically, like why is it good to have a strong downtown? I know that yeah. sounds basic, but I'd be interested to hear your answer. Well, that's a very good question because um, we have now, you haven't, David, but Irvin and I have lived through the period of, of a small town being the center for a lot of things, not just commerce, but activities of different kinds and so on. And um, when the donut took place, it changed the ball game because the commercial side of it really suffered. And there were, as in Goshen, there were a few people, families generally, who hung on to their businesses, the jewelry stores, the, the different places who are real old timers here. But they can't support the, the overall. Um, so, so, how important is it to have a historic district? So what? I can go to the mall and get everything I want. I can go to the perimeter around here and order every burger that's been made. Why is it important? And I, we, we talk about that a lot at home. And there was a time when I thought it was, always, it was only important to the older community. They had this nostalgia about what they lost. And Frankly, I think we were wrong because it's people like you, and I'm sorry to hear you're leaving, but it's people like you who have come into this and for whatever reason have been drawn to the brew or to this or to the, the, the what's the place down, the old electric place down here, the, the bar. That oh, they Goshen, did Goshen, Goshen Brewing? Brewing, that they did such a nice job on, or the market, or the guilds. Everybody seems to be drawn back to a physically defined, historic looking, feeling place. A, a community, I would say, you know, a community focus. How, how do the uh, malls and the strips, you know, define a community? The downtown does. Yeah. I mentioned Kendallville. Have you ever been to Marion, Indiana? Yep. And isn't that horrible? Yep. I mean, that's a wreck of a city. It's hopeless, I think. I think some of them are. But they're hopeless, I think, because of, because of the community. Yeah. Not because they can't do it. Uh -huh. They just don't... They either don't have community support at the political level to start it, or an individual or a small group who decide they want to take this thing on. What's been done here is pretty remarkable, I, I think, that, because 
everything sort of fell in place, and mostly the people who came to support it. But well, maybe I, it was the right time, because they say, you know, after a couple of generations, the new generation looks back and mm. sees what was important mm -hmm. and can be important and useful and uh, pleasant right now. I think there, there are generational um, mm -hmm. gaps or lags in regard to historic things. Mm. Well, the malls offered that to a whole generation who really didn't have it. Boy, they could go down there and hang out. And yeah. Just, it was a wonderful place, but I don't know, that's a little above my pay grade to figure out <laughs> why people do what they do. But yeah, it's sociology, uh, I think I that the Goshen should be very proud of itself for the support they've given to this. Well, Dave, when I think about you and this work that we've been talking about, I'm reminded of um, Pericles of ancient Athens. He was the uh, tyrant, or we would say the mayor or the president or whatever of ancient Athens. And he is quoted as having said, I can't lead an army into battle, but I can make a small city great. That would be my tribute to you. I'll buy it because <laughs> I could not lead an army into battle. <laughs> and if, the, if I have a shortcoming, and I do, it's my um, my lack of tolerance of groupthink. I've said this so many times in the meeting. You want me to do this? I will do it. I will not, do, I will not be a part of design by committee. I will not do that. And I don't know any successful project that goes that way. Frank Gehry makes the decisions. He has a lot of people who have experience who are giving him information that allows him to make the best decision. I can fit into that to some extent. The problem with this kind of thing versus Frank Gehry is that I have absolutely no control. I don't have a position in the city. I don't have anything except my own individual investment in time and energy. So it's very hard to make that comparison. But if I have, uh, and I know this, if I have a, a failing, it's the fact that uh, I have a short fuse in listening to opinion instead of experienced ideas, which makes me not a good team player. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe we should put this segment somewhere else rather than at the very end. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs>